Hi, I'm Rev Myron. I'm a minister through Pathways of Light, and I've been a Course in Miracles student for 40 years. I'm um, going through the lessons this year, and I'm asking Jesus to clarify for me and then writing from that clarity. And that's what I'm sharing with you today. So let's get started. Today, we're looking at lesson 136. Sickness is a defense against the truth. No one can heal, paragraph one, no one can heal unless he understands what purpose sickness seems to serve. For then he understands as well, its purpose has no meaning. So I'm going to stop there for a moment and just share a little bit with you about what I think about this. So no one can heal unless he understands what purpose sickness seems to serve. And we're going to be looking at that as we do this lesson. Why do we have sickness? Why do we choose sickness? Because we would have to choose it. God didn't create sickness. So we must have made it. And it must serve some meaning for us. And, he's, and so he says, for then he understands as well, its purpose has no meaning. Well, what kind of meaning is that? That we would choose sickness over reality, choose sickness over God. See, that has no meaning. So it says being causeless and without, without a meaningful intent of any kind, it cannot be at all. So right away, we're being told this is an illusion. You cannot actually be sick. It says, when this is seen, healing is automatic. It dispels this meaningless illusion by the same approach that carries all of them to the truth and merely leaves them there to disappear. And I know that Probably you've done this. I know I have. When I was worried about my daughter, I carried that worry to the truth. I carried it to the Holy Spirit within my mind. And I left it there for him to heal. And it disappeared. <laughs> so we can do the same thing with sickness. Because sickness, the, the thought of sickness, is no different than the thought of maybe one of my children is suffering or maybe i don't have enough money or maybe i have i don't know a fear of heights okay they're all just thoughts and if these thoughts do not come from god then they're just meaningless and and if we don't want them if we bring them to the truth they will disappear maybe not all at once maybe not at first but if we're persistent in that until we've educated our mind, taught our mind what it is that we want to believe, that we do believe. And so doing it, sometimes just doing it repeatedly gets us to that. Or just maybe sometimes it's, it's like I've had enough. <laughs> I'm done. I'm tired of it. Sometimes that is what gets us. Um, to the healing. So why do we get sick anyway? The world says it's because we're being attacked by germs and viruses or because of our DNA. It says that someone gave it to us, so they are guilty. Do you see the pattern? According to the world, we are victims and something or someone else is guilty. That is what the world is for a place to put all this denied guilt that we harbor. Sickness also proves that we really are bodies and not the son of God. To be truly healed, we must give up our fantasy of victimhood and of being bodies. You would think this would be easy and welcome, but the desire to hide from our guilt is stronger than our desire to hide, uh, to find our reality, at least for a while, that is true. This is hard to believe, but evidently it's true because here we are. Even as I sit here writing this, I have an appointment with a doctor for a foot problem that won't heal. The problem is a defense against the truth. 
So sickness is paragraph two. Sickness is not an accident. Like all defenses, it is an insane device for self-deception. And like all the rest, its purpose is to hide reality. Attack it, change it, render it inept, distort it, twist it, or reduce it to a little pile of unassembled parts. The aim of all defenses is to keep the truth from being whole. The parts are seen as if each one were whole within itself. Because of our desire to be the special individual self, we deliberately choose sickness to keep the illusion of being a body in place. It's no different than how we use guilt, making others guilty so they appear more innocent and we appear more innocent in comparison. We do these things to keep ourselves tethered to the world. All is one and perfect love, but these defenses are used to pre prove that all is separate, imperfect, and fearful. Three, defenses are not unintentional, nor are they made without awareness. They are secret magic wands you wave when truth appears to threaten what you would believe. They seem to be unconscious, but because of the rapidity with which you choose to use them. In that second, even less, in which the choice is made, you recognize exactly what you would attempt to do and then proceed to think that it is done. Four, who but yourself evaluates a threat, decides escape is necessary, and sets up a series of defenses to reduce the threat that has been judged as real. All this cannot be done unconsciously. But afterwards, your plan requires that you must forget you made it so. It seems to be external to your own intent, a happening beyond your state of mind, an outcome with a real effect on you instead of one affected by yourself. Have you ever had something coming toward your eyes and quickly you blink? It doesn't seem like you decide to blink, but that's what is actually happening. We do the same with all defenses. We feel our little self is under attack and we plan a defense. One way we do this is that we decide on sickness to establish the body's reality. Part of the plan is that we do this in secret, even from ourselves. And so we quickly forget that we're the ones waving the magic wand. After all, even if we're not crazy enough to admit to choosing sickness over awakening, Forgetting is necessary to preserve the illusion of victimhood. Five, it is this quick forgetting on the part of the part you play in making your reality that makes defenses seem to be beyond your own control. But what you have forgot can be remembered, giving willingness to reconsider the decision, which is doubly shielded by oblivion. Your not remembering is but a sign that this decision still remains in force as far as your desires are concerned. Mistake not this for fact. Defenses must make facts unrecognizable. They aim at doing this and it is this they do. So I'm ready to give up this game and awaken fully from the illusion of separation. I want to give up all defenses against this because I'm ready for this. The fear that is left in my mind causes resistance and it shows up in the body. One day recently, I had an experience of witnessing the mind recoil from giving up individuality completely. I can't really remember it, only that it happened. It is like I'm betraying myself. And what do you do when you find the enemy and it is you? <laughs> My decision is to acknowledge that there is still some hidden fear and continue to do whatever is in front of me to do. I cannot fail to let go of the self. And so I can afford to be patient with myself. Six, 
Every defense takes fragments of the whole, assembles them without regard to all their true relationships, and thus constructs illusions of a whole that is not there. It is this process that imposes threat and not whatever outcome may result. When parts are wrested from the whole and seen as separate and holes within themselves, they become symbols standing for attack upon the whole, successful in effect and never to be seen as whole again. And yet you have forgotten that they stand but for your own decision of what should be real to take the place of what is real. We're whole, one divided, one undivided self in God. But we don't want that. We want to be special and separate. And so we gave ourselves bodies and made an entire world of separate parts. There are trees and grass and sky and earth. There are oceans and lakes and ponds and rivers. Everything continues to fragment as we name this land one thing and that land another. We make imaginary borders so that we know when we have crossed into someone else's land. Our relationships reflect this separation idea. Sickness is just another attack on wholeness. I am sick and you are not. I suffer in this way and you suffer in that way. I have pain in my feet, not in my head or my arms. And when the pain is in another part of the body, it's a different kind of pain with a different cause. Everything here seems to be a fragment of a whole. You know, and even within those fragments, we see the fragment as its own whole. So when someone says, I have a headache, it's like headache is a whole thing. And everybody knows what you mean. I have cancer and everybody sees cancer as a whole thing. And we all have thoughts about what that means. Strange how we have done this. Seven, sickness is a decision. It's not a thing that happens to you quite unsought, which makes you weak and brings you suffering. It is a choice you make, a plan you lay, when for an instant truth arises in your own diluted mind and all your world appears to totter and prepare to fall. Now are you sick that truth may go away and threaten your establishments no more. This paragraph is seldom met with happiness and is often ignored or denied. We choose sickness and for a specific reason. We don't want our defenses destroyed while we still value them. They are the wall that keeps reality at bay, out of sight so that we can ignore it. And the reality is, that we're not bodies, how can we ever be sick? Spirits cannot be sick. Thoughts and the mind of God cannot be sick. That's a reality that we're trying to ignore. Eight, how do you think that sickness can succeed in shielding you from truth? Because it proves a body is not separate from you. And so you must be separate from the truth. You suffer pain because the body does. And in this pain, you are made one with it. Thus is your true identity preserved. And the strange haunting thought that you might be something beyond this little pile of dust, silenced and stilled. For see, this dust can make you suffer, twist your limbs and stop your heart commanding you to die and cease to be. Nine, thus is a body made stronger than the truth, which asks you to live, but cannot overcome your choice to die. And so the body is more powerful than everlasting life, heaven more frail than hell, and God's design for the salvation of his son opposed by a decision stronger than his will. His son is dust, the father incomplete, 
and chaos sits in triumph on his throne. That's a bleak description, and yet, is that not exactly what we do? We may prefer to believe that sickness is just an unavoidable part of life or that we are victims of sickness, but the truth is, sickness is our defense against God in heaven. Sickness proves that we are not the son of God, not spirit, and certainly not eternal. Sometimes people project their rage onto God and ask, why me, Lord? Now we've not only made ourselves different than we were created, we've made God different than he is and as guilty as we believe we are. And sickness seems to prove that we have a will separate from God and ours is stronger. 10. Such is your planning for your own defense. And you believe that heaven quails before such mad attacks as these, with God made blind by your illusions, truth turned into lies, and all the universe made slave to laws which your defenses would impose on it. Yet who believes illusions but the one who made them up? Who else can see them and react to them as if they were the truth? 11. God knows not of your plans to change his will. The universe remains unheeding of the laws by which you thought to govern it. And heaven has not bowed to hell, nor life to death. You can but choose to think you die or suffer sickness or to start the truth in any way. What is created is apart from all of this. Defenses are plans to defeat what cannot be attacked. What is unalterable cannot change, and what is wholly sinless cannot sin. No matter how hard we try or how elaborate our imagination, God remains God. Heaven is unaffected. We are, as God created us, whole, sinless, and beloved. Well, such is a simple truth. It does not make appeal to might or triumph. It does not command obedience, nor seek to prove how pitiful and futile your attempts to plan defenses that would alter it. Truth merely wants to give you happiness for such its purpose is. Perhaps it sighs a little when you throw away its gifts, and yet it knows with perfect certainty that what God wills for you must be received. We attack reality and reality simply waits patiently for our tantrum to subside and all the while it continues to gift us with love and peace and joy, whether we accept them or not. <laughs> because it knows that they are received. Okay, so 13, it is this fact that demonstrates that time is an illusion. For time lets you think what God has given you is not the truth right now, as it must be. The thoughts of God are quite apart from time. For time is but another meaningless defense you made against the truth. Yet what he wills is here, and you remain as he created you. I seldom think of time as a defense against the truth, but now I see how that is true. Believing in time, it is easy to think that I will be with God at some point. This allows me to ignore the fact that I am already in God so that I can go on pretending to be something else. I am a thought of God and thoughts leave not their source. And, and in this case, we can say, that thoughts, capital T, leaves not their source, capital S. I'm safe, however, I pretend otherwise, for nothing else is possible. 14, truth has a power far beyond defense, for no illusions can remain where truth has been allowed to enter. And it comes to any mind that would lay down its arms and cease to play with folly. It is found at any time today, if you, 
will choose to practice giving welcome to the truth. I remember David Hofmeister saying that when he started doing the lessons, he did each one as if this was the day he awakened. He was right to do that. Time is an illusion and has no power except as we give it power. We cannot be bound to time unless we want that. Jesus assures us that we will awaken and how we awaken has been decided. But when we awaken, it's up to us. Truth will come to us when we want it. Maybe today. Hmm? 15. This is our aim today. And we will give a quarter of an hour twice to ask the truth to come to us and set us free. And truth will come for it has never been apart from us. It merely waits for just this invitation, which we give today. We introduce it with a healing prayer to help us rise above defensiveness and let truth be as it always has been. Sickness is a defense against the truth. I will accept the truth of what I am and let my mind be wholly healed today. 16, healing will flash across your open mind as peace and truth arise to take the place of war and vain imaginings. There will be no dark corners sickness can conceal and keep defended from the light of truth. There will be no dim figures from your dreams nor their obscure and meaningless pursuits with double purposes insanely sought remaining in your mind. It will, be a, it will be healed of all sickly wishes that it tried to authorize the body to obey. It is our desire, our decision that brings healing to the mind. Nothing else is needed if we have made the decision that right now, I am done with the world and the desire for a special self. If, however, we are done with most of the world, but there's still some part we still long to keep, then it's not done. Only in the illusion can we divide the whole into parts and pick and choose what we want to keep and what we want to release. But this is just a thought in the mind and we can change our mind. These practices are a way to do that. We use them to instruct the mind in what we choose to believe now. 17. Now is the body healed because the source of sickness has been opened to relief. And you will recognize you practice well by this. The body should not feel at all. If you have been successful, there will be no sense of feeling ill or feeling well of pain or pleasure. No response at all is in the mind to what the body does. Its usefulness remains and nothing more. This is another way of stating that the body is nothing. It is only a projection of the mind. It cannot do anything. Only the mind does that. It seems like the body gets hungry, feels pain, gets fat or skinny or anything else, but it is a mind that feels its lack and projects that lack onto the body as hunger. It is a mind that feels guilt and so projects pain as punishment onto the body. Ego appetites are often satiated through the body, but it is always a mind that does this. When the mind is freed, it does not need to project imagined needs onto the body. 18, perhaps you do not realize that this removes the limits you had placed upon the body by the purposes you gave it. As these are laid aside, the strength the body has will always be enough to serve all truly useful purposes. The body's health is fully guaranteed because it is not limited by time, by weather or fatigue, by food and drink, or any laws you made it serve before. You need do nothing now to make it well, for sickness has become impossible. 
Our choice for ego has caused us to believe that we are slave to the body over which we have little control. This is an illusion. We are free. And when we accept our freedom, we stop punishing the body and the body will reflect that freedom. Hold on to the guilt, the fear, and the defenses we think protect us and the body will reflect those limits as sickness. <clears throat> 19, yet this protection needs to be preserved by careful watching. If you let your mind harbor attack thoughts, yield to judgment, or make plans against uncertainties to come, you have again misplaced yourself and made a bodily identity which will attack the body, for the mind is sick. 20, give instant remedy should this occur by not allowing your defensiveness to hurt you longer. Do not be confused about what must be healed, but tell yourself, I have forgotten what I really am, for I mistook my body for myself. Sickness is a defense against the truth, but I'm not a body and my mind cannot attack. So I cannot be sick. We must protect what we gain as we release more and more ego beliefs. Jesus is giving us a list of errors to watch for, and he has given us a remedy against them. Let us remember that we are not a body. We cannot be sick. If it feels like we are, there's something in the mind that needs correction, and we can get that correction simply by wanting it and asking for it. Thank you so much for doing this lesson with me. Thanks for watching my video. And if you found it helpful, please like it. And if you haven't yet, subscribe. And I'll be back tomorrow with another lesson.